episode is sponsored by Lookout Games. Episode 28 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm super duper pumped and tired, but super <laughs> duper pumped to be here today with Paula Deming from Things Get Dicey, who creates some of the best and funniest board game content on YouTube, period. How's Aww. it going today, Paula? <laughs> That's so nice. What a lovely intro. I will say it's going today. Um, I'm really glad. I was rocking out to that theme music. I'm glad that it's <laughs> nice. a bop because I needed the energy infusion because <laughs> uh, I have been home from Essen for less than 24 hours. And so uh, my oh body's my like, goodness. in Germany, it's like <laughs> four in the morning. You should be asleep. <laughs> Oh, I feel I feel that. I feel that. I I got home a couple of days ago Monday afternoon, but I feel like I'm still not adjusted either, yeah. you know, just not brain fog, tired throughout the day, waking up way too early. Yeah, you're like, "Well, how could I be so tired?" <laughs> and then still wake up at 3.30 in the morning and be like, well, guess it's time. And I'm like, what? How is? No. It's rough. <sighs> it's rough. I'm I'm ready to be just back to normal. But yes. I know it'll probably be like, isn't there like a calculation for depending on how many time zones you cross? It takes X amount of days to kind of. I think flip. there is a calculation. I don't know what it is, and my brain is not in a place to be able to remember it. What I find interesting, though, is when I go there, because I travel to uh, England for Aircon, and I now two years in a row now have gone to Germany for Essen, and I find that traveling there, my jet lag is not that bad. But coming huh. home, I really struggle with it, and I'm trying to figure out if that's because for so that going forward is easier than going backwards hmm. in time or if it's just because when I'm going you know we're going for conventions and seeing friends and doing yeah. things and so we're like it's exciting going so yeah. our body gets tricked into feeling awake as opposed to when I come <laughs> home and I'm like sat in front of my computer trying to do work and I'm like no <laughs> not happening mm -mm. <laughs> yeah no it's not exciting enough to fight through this <laughs> yeah, I, I think I feel the same way. I think it's because of the excitement kind yeah. of of going somewhere new and doing cool stuff. But yeah, the, the travel back is always so rough and just kind of getting readapted to Pacific time. Ugh. Yeah, it is, it's rough. <laughs> but aside from just getting back to Essen, what's <laughs> new in your world? What new? You know, I knew that you were going to ask me this question, Candace, and I was like, wow, I can't think of anything that's new that's not board game related. How yeah. about this? Um, I'm playing a Pathfinder character right now. So this is oh. this is adjacent, board game adjacent. It's in the tabletop world and uh, just recently leveled up to level cool. four. So Congrats. that's new. Thank you. It's very exciting. I have an additional second level spell slot, so that makes me pretty happy. That's cool. <laughs> do you Wait do a much second. Uh, TTRPG stuff? Uh, well, it's funny that you mentioned Pathfinder because mm -hmm. I legit maybe two weeks ago somehow I'm trying to remember why, but jet lag. Uh, yeah. I got. I, I, I've I rediscovered or kind of discovered Pathfinder Adventure card game. Oh. And I'm trying to remember right now. It's not going to come to me until probably like we're midway through recording. But I don't remember why it popped on my radar, but I ended up buying it. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, no. it's basically like a card game RPG where you don't need a DM Oh, that's and you cool. Pick a character and you explore and you're looking for like a villain. And I have not I have very minimal experience with RPGs, mm -hmm. but I'm very 
curious. Mm -hmm. And um, so I figured this would be a good way to kind of explore it a little bit, but sort of more in a board game fashion. Yeah, definitely. You know, but yeah, so I when you said Pathfinder, I was like, I know a little bit about that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is so a that's a great way that's to it kind it of like me. explore the RPG world through something that's a little bit more like in the middle with the card game, the cards leading you through. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. I'm not familiar with that, but I will have to look it up. Is yours is yours like just straight up RPG? Like you have a DM and mm -hmm. you're you're just telling stories and rolling yeah. dice. Rolling dice. I rolled a natural one today, so that's a critical failure. Uh, oh, yeah, role playing. I hate to see it. Doing <laughs> it happens to me so much. I have a dice <laughs> curse. Um, <laughs> I legitimately do. Some people are like. It's statistics. You literally can't have, like, statistically, <laughs> dice, dice do this. And I'm like, okay, well, you watch me roll dice then, and you tell me. And then they're like, wow, I can't believe you rolled four ones in a row. And I'm like, yeah, where are your statistics now? <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. What else is new besides Pathfinder leveling up? That's cool. It's so hard for me to think of non-board game related things. And that's because my work is board games, but also my fun <laughs> is board games. Yeah, your life is board games. Huh? You know, so then it's like, wow, that's everything. But there's got to be something non-board game related. Oh, uh, I got tickets to go to the Magic Castle. Sweet. Awesome. I'm very excited. It's my birthday coming up, so I'm going uh, for oh. my birthday. And I oh. love magic. That's uh, so cool. And so I'm very excited uh, to dress up and go. So for people who are listening who don't know, the Magic Castle is a like magician's club in L.A. And it's in this cool old building that looks kind of like a castle. And you go in and you're not allowed to take photos and there's a dress code and you can see different performances of different magicians, close up magic and also like stage magic. They have all kinds of stuff. And it's so fun if you like magic. And I do. Uh, I'm a it's, magician's dream audience member. I am delighted awesome. at all moments during a magic that is, show. <laughs> that is awesome. Is it your first time going? I've been twice, but three times before. I've actually been like three times before, but it's been oh, a wow, while cool. since the last time I went. I just love it. So I'm very excited about that. I have only been once, but it was amazing. I have a friend, uh, my friend Calvin, back on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. He is a magician, really <gasps> awesome close-up so cool. magician. Yeah, and so he was coming out to LA, him and his wife, and he has a you know a friend that got us in, and it was so cool. I I need to get back there. I need to get back there at some point. But that's awesome. What a cool little birthday treat. Yeah, I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering we both just returned from Essence Spiel a few days ago, you just yesterday. A few hours, a mere <laughs> hours ago. <laughs> Today, we're going to share some of our experiences from Spiel 2023. We're going to talk about a few games we played and even some that we discovered for the first time at Spiel that weren't previously on our radars. Heck yeah. Heck yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? Yeah. And <laughs> even though we were both there, we did not bump into each other. Not once. No. It's amazing. And it's like this at every convention where there'll be like people, for some reason, I just see I run into multiple times. And then some people that after, I'm like, wait, you were there too? <laughs> but yes. at Essen, especially because it's so huge and there are so many different halls you can be in. Yeah. And there are people I'm like, oh, yeah, XYZ person who is my friend was there. And I never saw them once. But I it's... ran into Simi Co-op three times, you know? <laughs> which was it's... great. They're lovely people. <laughs> it is. It is wild. I was thinking the same thing. Because I I realized either from social media or just from talking to someone else that, you know, so-and-so is there. I'm like, I have not seen them at all. Yeah. But yet I ended up bumping into Stella from uh, Meeple University <laughs> yeah. a million times. Yeah. Like, we have like a joking thing because last year I bumped into her like getting off the subway. And that was the first time I met her. And then this year, and I think at Gen Con, we had the same thing where we just <laughs> we just always just gravitate towards each other. 
And last year I bumped into you and Matthew at, yes. um, at Essen, but mm-hmm. not this year. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, wild. Well, ha- yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I wonder if we saw different things, if we saw some of the same things, because um, there's so many games there. Yeah. But there's a million games I didn't see. And I went through the preview list on mm-hmm. BGG before going and like marked all the games I was interested in. And it was something like 60 games that I was <laughs> interested in. Yeah. And I think I managed to actually find and see like 10 of those games. <laughs> I saw a lot of other things, but I'm like, wow, there are things that I specifically wanted to see that I never ended up f- finding. Yeah. So. It's like you need like a whole week there or something. Oh, yeah. Like going to Disney World and hitting like all the parks and trying to hit every ride. It's yeah. just, it's so massive. And I felt like, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. We okay. will talk okay. about this more in a minute. But yeah, I totally feel you there. It's, it's huge. And I feel like I went in, you know, I had a list too. I had a list of things I wanted to buy. I had a mm-hmm. list of games I was interested in. And I still found myself on that last day uh, just trying to cram stuff in. Like, yeah. oh, I didn't get to check this out. I didn't get. And it's just like, you're you're really not going to get to see it all. You but can't. I'm I'm glad we didn't bump into each other because now we can talk about yeah. things and, you know, see if we saw any of the same things or you know, it'll be good. But before we start talking about our Spiel 2023 experiences, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Paula. So let's jump into fresh plays. So non-Essen Spiel related, uh, I played for the first time, right before Spiel, uh, Acquire, the classic Ooh. 1964 Sid Saxon game. There's been a million different boxes of it. It's <laughs> yeah. been published by tons of people. The most recent new edition is from Renegade, uh, but it's had editions from Avalon Hill. There's a 3M version. Wow. Yeah. It plays two to six. And uh, it's st- this stands out to me because it's a game. <sighs> so years ago, I was at my grandparents' house and I was like, whoa, what's this weird game that they have? What's this board <laughs> game? And they had the 3M version. Uh, it's like green on the cover, kind of looks like a book on the side. It's like a maybe oh, wow. a first edition of the game. And I was opening it up. It looked like it had never been played. And I was like, this game looks so boring. <laughs> I will never play this. But it would be cool to have it. Um, right, right. I don't have it right now. My cousin has it. But he says he's going to send it to me. <laughs> oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> but, so my fingers are crossed. But then uh, I was going to the World Series of Board Gaming and they had it have it there as part of their competition, and I was going to be doing commentary on it. So I was like, I should learn this game so I can talk about it. And while I was at the event, I was like, well, it would be fun to try and play the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to see, just to know. Because I had started researching how it plays, and I was like, huh, in this game that looks so dry and boring. And I'm an Ameritrash gamer. I really am. But I was like, this looks so dry and boring. And yet, something about these rules This could be interesting because it's all about Mm. um, buying stocks in companies. In some versions, they're like hotels and others are like corporations. I feel like it's the game that Monopoly, this is what everyone should be playing instead of Monopoly in a sense. Yeah, I got Um, it. But so you are in investing in companies and you you have these uh, tiles that are, uh, there's a grid. The board is a grid, a uh, numbers and letter grid. And so you have these tiles and you have to play a tile every turn. And it co- each tile corresponds to a spot on the grid. And as soon as two tiles are connected, you can found a company on them. And you're trying to grow your company, merge it with other companies, acquire other companies. And mm. then when you when you get acquired, when what company you have stocking gets acquired, you get a bonus if you're the majority shareholder, a bonus if you're the minority shareholder, so first or second in amounts of stocks. And then you can sell stocks, you can trade them in for 
stocks of the company that's acquiring you. And you're trying to figure out like when to sell, when to buy, how to get the majority in something so that you get the bonuses so that by the end of the game, obviously you have the most money. So there's kind of, it's economics also in a way kind of like, I'm going to call it area control. It's not quite, but like it feels like that to me a little. Yeah. And I was like, man, actually maybe that does sound interesting. And I tell you what, I think I fell in love with it. Oh, uh, cool. I was trying to learn it and I'm going on and on and on, but I was trying to learn it. And this lovely gentleman came over and was like, oh, Acquire, I've been playing this game for 20 years. And I was like, do you have a minute? Do you want to just like do a quick teach? Because it's not the most complicated rule set. Like maybe you can just spend a minute. And then he was like, well, what if I play it with you? And as you play, if you have questions, you can ask me. So I had the most amazing like learning experience game. I have ever had of any game I've ever learned. It was, he was so lovely and the people I was playing with were delightful as well. And just, we talked about our strategy and we learned and I fell in love with the game. And awesome. Now I'm like, okay, now I have to get a copy of it (laughs) because I think I want to play this all the time. (laughs) Yeah, acquire. I'm sorry. I I talked on and on and on about it, but I had a really good time with it. That's so cool. Yeah, I had, uh, I don't know if you know Jennifer Schlickburn. Uh, she is a so. um, a longtime gamer and a good friend of mine from LA. Mm-hmm. And she, when I first um, got into modern board games, she kind of was my uh, Yoda. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she was just like, you, and she, and she could tell like, I'm kind of, I'm an Omni gamer. Mm-hmm. And she's just like, you have to play these like, classics and this was one she introduced me and i remember liking it a lot it was at strategicon yeah. and uh but i haven't revisited it and then like have you ever played big boss no but it looks very similar, similar. Right? and i think <laughs> i actually uh because i was talking with matthew jude about who i do a lot of content with and um we do stuff together on watch it played and for this game is broken and he was i was telling him how much i enjoyed acquire and he was like, oh, you should check out Big Boss. And I guess apparently ah. he was saying that I think somewhere on the box or in the rules, they cite Acquire as being an inspiration for the game. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I played. So I had heard Big Boss was awesome from a lot of people. It was out of print for a while. Mm-hmm. I think it is Funko who just bought it, brought it back. In that print. sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And I played it. I know like Eric Martin loves it. And so he taught it to me at BGG Spring, this past BGG Spring. And I remember thinking, I liked it a lot, but it reminded me of a choir. Mm. And I don't, I can't remember offhand, like what's different about them, but there's something that's similar. Either way, awesome that these two classic games are kind of, you know, being reprinted and they're available for people to play. I cannot believe Acquire's been around since 1964. I know, right? And it's good. I was like, Sid Saxon, you beautiful genius. <laughs> How dare you make such a good game? <laughs> I have a Sid Saxon story for you real quick. <gasps> okay. So I forget when this was. A couple, It must have been right after Gen Con, I think. I, I got COVID after Gen Con. I was sick. Oh. And... Matt, my partner Matt, mm-hmm. had um one of his college friends was in town and they were going to dinner. I couldn't go, so I missed out on this dinner. And they ended up talking about me at some point and saying, Oh, you know, uh, and they said, Yeah, I work in the board game industry. And then his friend's wife starts talking about Oh, my and the, oh, they were describing my like board game wall, you mm-hmm. know, my shelf of all these games. And Matt's friend's like, no, it looks like a game store in there, you know? <laughs> and, and she's like, she's like, she's like, that's how my grandpa's uh, room was. And then they're talking, they're talking. And I'm sorry, is her grandpa Sid Saxon? Yes, is that what you're about to yes. tell me? Yes, and, and Matt comes home and he's like, yeah, her grandfather designed Can't Stop <gasps> and some game that starts with an A. And I was just like... <laughs> Holy cow. Of course, I'm not there for that dinner, right? (laughs) Amazing. How cool is that, though? And it's like someone Matt went to college with wife. That's so cool. Yeah, I I could not believe that. So I just had to throw that little story in. That's very cool. But I, on the other hand, 
have been playing some slightly newer games. A, <laughs> just my slightly friend, newer. Slightly than newer, than just from 1964. 20, not 1964, <laughs> not quite 1964, 2022. We're, we're going so, into the future a little just bit. jumping ahead just a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Tim was coming over for a game night. And we had some time before others were arriving, Mm -hmm. and he brought a um, wallet game called Battlecrest from Button Shy. Oh, cool. It is designed by Dustin Dobson and Milan Zikovic, and this game is so cool. (laughs) Okay, so I've played some Button Shy games before. Mm -hmm. I played in Vino Morte. I've played Tussie Mussy. Oh, yeah. I love Tussie Mussy. Yeah. Great, great stuff. I'm uh, like so impressed with what people can do with a small deck of cards. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel guilty buying a lot of them because they don't take up that much space. They take up like no room. (laughs) It's perfect. (laughs) It's perfect. But Battlecrest, have you heard of this one? I haven't. Okay. Let me tell you. This is a card-based tactical skirmish game for two players, but you can get, it has some expansions, so you can get expansions to play it solo or with up to four players. This game has perfect information, zero randomness, and it is reminiscent of Summoner Wars. Okay. So you have these asymmetric heroes, like you'll be a hero, I'll be a hero, and we are basically trying to take each other down. And since this is a, All based, this is all cards. This whole game is just a small deck of cards. You have a hero, which is a card. I have a hero, which is a card. The board, quote, I'm putting air quotes up. (laughs) uh, The board is just six cards. So you have six map cards that you randomly place. And they're arranged in a particular way that kind of forms this invisible grid that you're going to be moving around with your hero and attacking each other. And... The cool thing is, well, there are lots of cool things, <laughs> but you have action cards. I think they, I don't know if all of the heroes have three action cards or if some have more. I don't recall that, but you have action cards. And so on your turn, um, you'll take an action. And if you take an action on a card, you exhaust it. So you mm-hmm. rotate it. Okay. And when you rotate it, you're exposing basically a crest, which is why it's called Battle Crest. And you have these, each hero has these different crests and you have other action cards that are boosted based on which crests are visible. Yeah. So you have this whole thing of like, oh, do I want to do this action so that I can rotate this and have that crest to boost this action, which I'm going to take next. The other clever thing. um, So that's clever thing. Number one, (laughs) Clever thing number two is at the top of the cards, picture the cards are all upright. You mm-hmm. have a value on the right corner, I think, that is a movement value. So when all of your cards are upright, you sum up the numbers on them, and that's how far you can move. That's your movement. But oh, of course, cool. when you exhaust one, now your movement goes down, but you have access to that battle crest. The other cool thing you could do, uh, besides messing with like this exhausting and you know revealing these battle crests, is you can do this thing, I think it's called focus. Mm-hmm. And when you focus, any of your exhausted cards become unexhausted and flip over. So these cards, your action cards are double sided. And oh, you have cool. Yes, yes. And you have other actions on the other sides and like different battle crests. Now, yeah. Is this cheating? Because a bunch shy <laughs> game is supposed to have what? Like 16 cards? And they're like, you know, a game. 18 what? or something. Yeah. This is yeah. now. Uh, it's actually, I've made a game with uh, 36 cards. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is very sneaky. <laughs> but yeah, so you're you're doing all this stuff. The other cool thing is when you when you move your hero around or your character, um if you are adjacent to certain locations, you can boost certain actions and sometimes that will flip over that map card and make make it have some other effects. So yeah, they're so really playing cool. with the so double-sided cool. cards. Yes. And then the last clever thing, or one more clever thing, because there's like so much more. Like I said, there are asymmetric factions and they all play very differently. I only played one game, but like my friend Tim showed me like a lot of, you know, one of the characters has this other thing that's this robot character that's moving around and uh, it's really cool. That okay. sounds so cool. But here's the other clever thing. How do you manage your health in this game? So... 
With a card, Paula. With a, a card. How, I should have guessed. <laughs> with another sneaky it, card. It, yep. You if you weren't jet lag, you would have you would have gotten that. That's right. One, I'd be but, like, I bet it's with a card. <laughs> yeah. So so basically you have a card. And let, let's picture again, you have your three action cards in mm-hmm. front of you. Mm-hmm. Above your action cards in like an invisible row, <laughs> you have a health card. Okay. And your health card might be like a space over from one of your action cards. Mm-hmm. When you take a hit, you slide it to the right. Okay. You slide it to the right, slide it to the right. Certain amount of spaces after it gets to the right, it resets back to the beginning of its invisible track mm-hmm. and flips over. And you slide to the right, slide it to the right. So you're keeping track of your health with this kind of invisible grid, but it's all like really cleverly documented on the card. And I don't know about you, but I I love games like this. You know, I love Summoner Wars. I love two-player kind of Mm -hmm. battler games. And I can't believe what this game is able to achieve with like a wallet. Just cards, cards. yes. Just a small deck of cards. It's so cool. It's so resourceful to to do it. And it does sound like such an interesting balance. You know, when you flip the cards, you're getting access to this power, but you're losing your ability to do movement. Or when you you flip them on their other side, now you have these other powers, but then you don't have access to the thing on the back. Like, And the way that that balances out by giving you something, but taking something away. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's it's super neat. And then the other thing I didn't mention is defense. So of Mm. course, on the bottom of your action card, you have defense. But if your cards are exhausted, you don't have access to those shields. So they do a lot with just, you know, simple, a simple deck of cards. I'm so excited because I ordered um, I ordered my own copy of yeah. pretty much everything that I can get. And they did a Kickstarter, I guess, maybe earlier this year um, for Battlecrest Year 2. And it has a, a new set of like a new map, a new set of map cards, more factions. And yeah. I, and the, That's cool. Zero randomness too. So for people who don't like rolling dice, it's like you're playing chess. Really, like you're moving a character around. You're making really, you know, strategic and tactical choices to attack somebody. If you're into that, I would highly recommend checking out Battlecrest. And it won't take up very much room on your shelf. Yeah. Yeah, that's the most amazing part. <laughs> it's a wallet game. <laughs> so what cool. else have you been playing lately? Okay, well, while we're talking about small card games, uh, I've got to talk about the game Nana slash Trio. So this is game Nana, but there's a new version of it called Trio. Uh, It was originally released in 2021. So we're going back in the past just a little again. (laughs) Uh, Designed by, I don't, I should have looked up the pronunciation of this name. So everyone, please forgive me. If we won't judge this you. isn't how you say your name, dear designer, Kaya Miano. Uh, that was good. That sounded good to me. Oh, hey, thank you. <laughs> yeah, published by Cocktail Games slash Mob Plus slash Underdog Games. Everything I was like, wow, everything I play gets published by multiple publishers. I <laughs> uh, can play two to five. And here's, so my friend Ruel Gaviola, uh, introduced this game to me. I'd heard some other people talking about it, but Ruel is the person who sat down and went, can we play Nana? I have Nana with me in my bag. Do you mind if we play it? And I was like, he was like, it'll take like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And I was like, yeah, okay. He was like, okay, hear me out. It's a mix of like (laughs) memory and go fish. And he was like, I know that doesn't sound appealing, but it's going to be great. Uh, I'm assuming you've played. Uh, I have. I yeah. have. Oh, my gosh. First of all, I will preface this by saying I've played it three times and I've won every time. Wow. Does that mean that that's maybe why I love it so much? Maybe. But <laughs> so you have a hand of cards and you order your cards from lowest value to highest value. And I can't remember now what the highest value card is. Maybe it's like 13. 12 or 13, something like that. And there's three of each number in the deck. And what you're trying to do is collect trios of numbers. And you need tr- a trio of trios, basically, to win. So, or if you collect the three sevens, you automatically win. Yep. 
Or if you collect, or if you if collect, you collect two sets, two that, like, total, sets to seven. That total seven, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can win. So well, how does this actually work? So you have your hand of cards and you can say to someone, uh, you can either ask one of the other players to show you their lowest card or their highest card. And that's it. You know, I might be like, Candace, show me your lowest card. And you show your lowest card, which happens to be a three. Now, I know that Ruel has a three in his hand because last turn, you asked him to show his lowest card and it was a three. So yep. then I'm like, okay, Ruel, show me your lowest card. And it's a three, but I need a third one. Well, I happen to have the three as my, not as my lowest card, but it's in the middle because my lowest card is a one. I cannot play my three to get the set. I have to wait until the three is my lowest card. And then I could be like, I'll show mine. And then you show it. And then you're like, ha ha, I get this set. And you collect it. There's also cards um, like a market of cards in the middle, but they're all face right. down. So you can also, as when it, so your action is, show me your lowest card, show me your highest card. You can apply that to yourself or you can flip over a card in the middle. But whenever that's done, if you have not collected a set of three, everything goes back into people's hands and the card in the middle flips back over. So that's where the memory component comes in. Because you're trying to remember, oh no, I know we've seen three 11s. Yeah. But can I remember who had that third 11. No, I can't. And that's, <laughs> that's where like the memory so aspect silly. comes in. <laughs> and it's so fun to just like be like, oh, wait, <laughs> Candace had that 11. Can yeah. show me your highest card? And you're like, oh, yeah. no. And then make those sets. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And it's just, it's so, the trio version has this, um, what I think is really nice, like Dia de los Muertos kind of style art to it. Um, but I also really love it. It's so difficult to, to get the, um, I believe it's the Japanese version of Nana that's got this really cute, like animals on it and shiny, like gold numbers. And it's so charming and quick. And every time I played it, we'd play it and then we'd all go, should we play that again? Like immediately (laughs) wanted to play it again. Um, uh, yeah, it's just. Charming. It's fun. Charming is the word for it. Nana slash trio. It's also on Board Game Arena. So trios on Board Game Arena. If you want to check it out digitally, it. you can do that. Yeah. it's yeah. It, it was described to me similar to you, except not with memory. It was just, it's go fish for gamers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That is you how go, it's... show me a, do you have any yeah. threes? <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, it's really fun to play it, especially at the end of the night when everybody's yeah. Brains are a little bit fried, yes. <laughs> and sometimes it's just it, the 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 cards that are on the table are so hard because you're like, I know there's a five in there. There's one in but there. Where but was which it? One where was, was it? it? And then yeah. you flip the wrong card, and then the next person goes and they make it happen. You're like, ah, no. <laughs> the best is though, like if I had two of the fives in my hand. Right. So I can be like, oh, yeah, I flip over the one in the middle. And like, there's the five. And then I'm like, Paula, show me your lowest card. And I flip Boom. over my own five. Paula, show me your next lowest card. I flip over my next five. Yep. I'm like, ha ha, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great feeling. <sighs> yeah. I That's happen fun. to score a copy of the, the Nana Christmas version of it. <gasps> oh, it's nice. So yeah. cute. It's so cute. But I'm glad that like Trio, you know, the reimplementation, mm-hmm. it's making it available because I know yeah. the Japanese version is very hard it's to hard get. It's hard to get, you know, yeah. Everyone I know who gets it will like buy several copies and that's how I got one. Yeah. I think uh, I think Aldi gave me one um, at BGG Spring because he got some from someone and was just like, here you go. Here you go. And they're like, you, that's how you have to do you. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm slightly cheating because I am going to talk about a game that I played at Essen, but it's not. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry, but it's not a 2023 Essen release. It was a game from Essen last year that I missed. (gasps) Yeah, so this is a game called Discordia. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No. I I remember seeing it last year and not being intrigued by the cover art and just, uh-huh. you know, I was like, eh, whatever, no, this okay. looks okay. Yeah. yeah. And Rado, I was watching Rado's uh, games he was excited about at Spiel mm-hmm. 2023, and he mentioned the expansion for Discordia. 
And when he described it, I was like, oh, I got to check this base game out. So then in true Candace fashion, I start <laughs> watching videos. I'm getting myself familiar with the game. I download the rules. I read it on the airplane. I you make prepped. sure. Yeah, yeah. I was I was really intrigued by this game. And it was funny because I went to demo it and I was basically teaching. And the guy, the demo guy was like, wow, you know it really good. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I got a little I got a little obsessed before Sometimes- Spiel. Side note, have you ever been doing a demo and then, because sometimes people who do demos don't get a chance. They don't have a lot of time sometimes to prep. Right. And sometimes right. a demo will be happening and I've researched a game and I'll just be like, oh, actually, I think you mean that that rule is this. Because <laughs> I actually yeah. know that you've taught the rule wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That does, that does happen. I always that feel does bad. That like, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, are you going to mention this thing? He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Discordia it's is hard 20- to be a demo work. So thank you <laughs> yeah. to the people who do demos. Yes, thank you. Seriously. But sometimes you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate <laughs> that they're out there to help us yes. even, you know, I never mind learning a game wrong the first time, you know. But yes, thank you for your service as demoers, demoers. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is 2022. It came out last year at Essen, and it's designed by Bernd Einst- Eisenstein. Eisenstein, not Einstein. Okay. Um, but Bernd Eisenstein, you might know from a game from 2009 called Peloponnese. And I don't know, or you might not know. <laughs> I, I don't, just, but I'm going to assume that a lot of people listening do know. Some people, I'm sure, will know this game, but it might be kind of a like a deep cut a little bit. Uh, but Peloponnese, Peloponnese... I'm just going to Google it while you're talking Please right now. do, please do. I ended up discovering this game uh, somehow back in the day. It's kind of an auction game. Mm -hmm. And I tracked down a copy from someone on the geek market and still have not played it. And this is probably, I don't know how long I've had it, but now I'm like, now I really want to try it now that I've played Discordia and I like this designer. That board, that cover, that box is a real <laughs> classic, classic right? kind of cover. You're like, oh, yeah, that's a game from 2009. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. Ooh. But I don't know if I watched a video on Peloponnese or something. I was like, this game is really cool. So I was really excited when I got a copy, but I guess I wasn't excited enough that I've gotten it played yet. Awkward. These things um, happen, you know? There are a lot of games to play. Yes, yeah. But now I want to, and I, I I'm, yeah, I'm going to break this one out at some point but uh i believe cool. both- i'm looking at the images on yeah on bgg actually yeah yeah both games are published by iron games which i think is burns uh publishing company oh, cool. um but back to discordia yeah yeah it yeah. plays with one to four players and this is a unique city building game because it has no victory points whatsoever i'm sorry how am i supposed to win I'm going to tell you, Paula. I'm going to tell you how you're going to win in this game. I describe a lot of board games when I do videos for Watch It Played, and never once have I been like, and there are no victory points. (laughs) Until now. Until you now talk about Discordia on your channel. (laughs) But Discordia, we are in Rome in 49 AD, and we're trying to like build up our cities, and we're building up Rome and everything. And that just looks like we all have our own city boards, like our own player boards. And we're going to be placing building tiles. And we are trying to get workers employed. So at the beginning of the game, everyone is going to draw 15 workers, little meeple people, out of a bag. So they come in one of four colors. So you'll get a random selection of colors. Uh, Blue is sailors, red are soldiers, yellow are farmers, and white are merchants. So you'll have some combination of 15 workers. Your goal is to get these workers employed. You want to build buildings so that you can put them onto buildings and get them out of there first. The game will end immediately when one person gets rid of all of their workers. But guess what? And are they the one who wins? 
Yes, and they win. Okay. That's it. No victory points. No victory points. Yeah. It's but it's it's, a race. it's wild and crazy. It's <laughs> wild and crazy. So if nobody wins automatically after four years or four game rounds, the player who has the least remaining workers wins. Okay, that makes so, sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But what you're doing in the game, and I, I should say – Every round, you don't just have those 15 workers because as you build up your city, you're kind of attracting more people to your city. Oh my gosh, I just got all of these jobs and now more people here and I have to find them jobs too. Pretty much, pretty much. (laughs) On your player board, there are different spaces that have a certain icon that says, hey, a new person is coming in unless you cover this space up with something. And then also as you build buildings onto your player board, Buildings will have a certain amount of spaces that can hold a certain – each space can Mm -hmm. hold maybe like one to three meeples, mostly one or two. But if I build a building that let's say it has two spaces and each space holds just one meeple, if at the end of the round I've only put one uh, one meeple in one of those spaces – I'm getting a new person for empty spaces that I haven't filled. So you're trying to fill every space on every building that you build, and you're trying to cover up these spaces that are also bringing in more people. Because And there's another way, like, you can work up this track to kind of reduce the amount of people coming in, but you're doing this crazy thing of, like, trying to get people out and avoid people, more people coming in. Now, the way your actions work in this game is it's a dice- Action selection. So whoever's the first player or the start Sounds player. Sounds like something I would like. I really like dice, this, like worker oh, placement type games. But I hope they won't curse you in this game. Well, this is why in, in some <laughs> ways I like them because I like rolling dice, but these numbers don't tell me if I succeed or not necessarily. They just yeah. tell me where I can place things. And a lot of times that's it. that works out much better for me. And guess what else? If you're the first player and you're the one rolling the dice, you get to choose one first. (gasps) So, (laughs) yeah, exactly. So you can leave the ones for everybody else. That's right. (laughs) Take those filthy ones. (laughs) So there are three colored dice, red, blue, and yellow. And when you roll the dice, whatever number is on them, you're going to put them on. There's a main board that's kind of in the center of the table. So there's a slot for one, two, Mm -hmm. three, four, five, six. And uh, so you put any dice matching the numbers in the appropriate slot. And that's going to tell you which actions you can take. There's a little column of actions you could take. And there are also tiles under each number that will be available, building tiles that you can take. So if I take a six, I can take one of the actions that are in the six column, or I could take one of the tiles that are in the six column. Cool. The other cool thing is, as you build up your city, the buildings that you're adding, usually, I think all of them, have a die on them. So it might be a gray die, or it could be a specific color die, like a red die, a red five. Mm -hmm. That means every time I take an action with a red five, I get to get a free placement of one of my (gasps) people into that building. Oh, that's sweet. Yes, yes. So you can kind of (gasps) trigger all this Oh my gosh, I need to play this. I know. It's fun. It's fun. (laughs) So you you um, you can end up like doing all sorts of crazy combos. You also on your player board have these two tracks, an expedition track and a development track. And they give you cool stuff as you go up these tracks. And uh, some of them let you get these like privileges, which give you special abilities. But I saw my friend Kayla played with me. We played a two player game, had a blast. Uh, She ended up crushing it by round three and she got rid of all her workers. I still had like nine left I think (laughs) it was it was rough but she had one turn where she was like okay I'm moving up this track which gives me this and then I trigger placing this and then I do this and I bump here and I get this yeah it's it's really cool and the the other thing is like I said the first player gets to pick whatever die they want Mm -hmm. they'll actually take the die off so they're the only one other people can't use use it right but then the other two stay on the board and anybody can activate Mm -hmm. them when it's their turn. It's one of those things like maybe Ganchan Clever or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. There's also this boat that tracks uh, seasons. So every year, every round is five turns. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's five seasons. And if you take a die where the boat is, you get a bonus free action too. The last thing I'll tell you about this game okay. is 
you, I mentioned there were soldiers. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole thing where at the end of the year, there are going to be raids, Germanic raids. So you know at the start of the round what one of the strength values are. But midway through as this boat's moving up, you flip the second one. And the first one's going to tell you if you don't have enough strength, like in your, you know, people in red buildings more Mm -hmm. or less, uh, this is your punishment for the round. You know that from the start of the round. When the other one flips over, then you see what you get if you do meet it. Oh, cool. So there's a little like tension, you know, like feed your people, kind of meet the demands. Tension. Yeah. Anyways. It sounds so cool. Yeah. I love too that. A lot of times in like a worker placement style game, you're trying to get to the point where you're getting more workers. Yeah. So that you can place more people for more actions. Right. But this is a nice little like flipping that on its head of being like, right. you don't want more workers. Right. Because the whole point is to run out of them. It sounds so interesting. Okay. Yeah. This is on my it, radar now. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. And it totally, again, when I saw the box cover, it looks like, oh, it's going to be the same old kind of thing. Yeah. But it, like it, it really plays differently. I love the fact that you were racing each other to get your workers out first. Um, All of the actions are very simple and straightforward, and you can do some really cool combo-y stuff with, again, triggering dice. Like, oh, maybe I want to take that action. But if I take that five, I get to trigger three buildings, which are going to let me put three people and get extra actions. And then uh, the other thing I'll mention is the new, I also got the um, the new Magna expansion, mm. and that adds asymmetric player boards. Oh, so cool. So in the base game, everybody has the same starting city board, mm-hmm. um, but this changes it. And I think everybody's tracks, like your expedition tracks are different. Like, so the boards are completely asymmetric. And there's one other thing I will add about the game, and that is your, um, what do you call them? What do you call these things? Ah. Oh, the, I mentioned you're putting building tiles. Mm-hmm. Well, a building has to be put on a foundation. So you need to kind of like have a pre-tile. And some mm-hmm. of them are pre-printed on the board. So you have right, to get right, those right. two, then build the building. So it's really cool. Um, that is Discordia. I definitely recommend uh, checking it out. Yeah, that was like one of, one of the games I, I bought like really soon. And I was like, let's play it. <laughs> awesome. It sounds yeah. cool. Yeah. Discordia. And now a word from our sponsor. Lookout Games is taking you into the wild with Forest Shuffle, a clever card game for families and nature lovers. Two to five players compete in gathering the most valuable trees to attract species and create an ecologically balanced habitat for flora and fauna. It all starts with a single tree. Each turn, you play cards from your hand to gather trees in your very own forest and attract wildlife. Every card contains different plants and animals that can be combined for extra points or bonus actions. Are you able to establish an ideal balance and create the most beautiful forest? Forest Shuffle comes with simple rules, beautiful illustrations, and multi-use cards. It works great no matter the player count and provides a near-endless number of tactical choices. Forest Shuffle is the first in the Lookout Green Line label, plastic-free and produced on FSC-certified paper. It's available for purchase now at your friendly local game store, and you can also play for free on Board Game Arena. So now that that was our little warm-up to talking about Spiel, let's (laughs) jump into our actual spiel experiences are no, we, spiel. We, spiel spiel the spiel spiel yes <laughs> <laughs> we kind of like talked about a bit already like what the, what the vibe was like mm-hmm. you know it was very lots of people i think that they yes. changed the way the halls were this year yeah they were laid out differently i know this was only my second sn so i don't have a long history of things to compare to but i know a lot of people who've been long time attendees were like oh it's so weird i don't know where any of the stuff is but <laughs> i liked the way it was laid out because what they did this year was they really grouped um like genres of games together so they had like in this hall is our family weight games in this hall are all the ttrpgs and collectible card games in this hall are the expert games which was hall three which we'll talk about but in this hall is (laughs) and i really liked that because if i want i knew okay if i want this kind of game oh it's probably going to be in this hall right so i i enjoyed that um me too yeah except hall three was 
always crowded. Way busier. So crowded. And that was like your more your heavier hobby level games, right? Um yeah. in Hall Three. It was packed all the time. All the time. Uh, it felt like a different whew. world in there. Yes. Like when you come yeah. from Hall One or Hall Two or any of the other halls and you walk into three, it's like, whoa. It's like, whoa, where I am I? I can't move. Yeah. <laughs> so many people. If you've never been to Essen, uh it's a really big con. And like Gin Con is really big, but there is something about I think Essen has got to be a lot bigger, right? Because yeah. Gin Con is like what there's a lot happening at Gin Con. And it takes like that whole convention center. Like it uses it up. It's not like there's small things, but like the main exhibitors hall is like one large hall three. room. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and at Essen, it's like seven different halls yeah filled with exhibitors yeah. and games and it, it's it's so much and at one point i was in the so there's this in the middle of the hall so you have like half the halls on one side of the building and then there's this galleria and um that's where a lot of like food vendors are and things and then on the other side of the galleria is like the other half of the halls so at one point i was standing in the galleria and the noise of people that I was hearing from whatever hall was like just down the way sounded like the rainforest, you know, like it sounded like <laughs> like the murmur and the movement yeah. of such a large crowd. It was like it almost sounded like rain. I was like, yeah. this is so interesting. This noise of like people. It's yeah. like sensory overload. Oh, my like, gosh. Yes, it, that that I'm really fascinated by that sound, too, of just people just, you yeah. know. Just lots of people. <laughs> it, 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 it's crazy. And you 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 kind of get absorbed in it. And then it's not until you step outside. Now, in the Galleria yeah. area, they have like the air conditioner or something blowing. So there was like a different sound in there. Yeah. But, when you, but when you step outside, it's just like, oh, like, oh that's nice. Really quiet. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need those moments. So did yes. you... Did you end up like flying directly into Essen? And wait, were you at World Series of Board Game just before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I went to the World Series of Board Trooper. Gaming in Vegas. And then from Vegas, I flew into Frankfurt. Um, and that was a few days before. I flew in on like Saturday, September 30th, I think. And Essen okay. started on... There's the, the press day on board. Wednesday, but the first real day, I'll say, is was like Thursday the 4th, right. I think, was the date. So I had a few days there. And so um, Matthew Jude met up with me. We actually then hopped on another train and went down into Bavaria, into Fusen. Uh, cool. Because that is very, very near uh, Neuschwanstein, uh, which is, if you've ever played the Castles of Mad King Ludwig, uh, Ludwig, Ludwig, uh, the castle on the cover of the box is Neuschwanstein. Uh, and I was cool. like, could we go? We have a couple days. Like, would you go with me to see this castle? Because that's a game I got very early into my uh, hobby, hobby board game life. And it's got a very special place in my heart. And I was like, I want to see it. And it was so like, That's we were cool. such nerds. We were standing there on this bridge looking at the castle and we're like, it's the box cover. Ah! <laughs> and like we did a tour inside and was like, this is the Venus Grotto. This is a tile in the game. Like, That's it's so awesome. cool. I, so, I'm yeah. trying to think when you said that castle name, it sounded very familiar. I think we might have gone when we went to Munich. I think yeah. we might have done a like trip a to that day castle. trip down from Munich. Yeah. Yes, you very yeah. likely did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. It, I didn't even realize because I haven't. I might have played uh, Castles of Mad King Ludwig once, but I never even realized that. That's cool. Yeah. It wasn't until you said it. I was like, I've been there. I know that it's name. Cool. <laughs> I like that game a lot. And um, oh, that makes me think of. A game that I wasn't planning. I don't think I was gonna. Did am I? Maybe am I talking about it later? Have I decided I want to talk about it? The <laughs> Blueprint of Mad King Ludwig. I think I am you, talking about you, that. Okay, we're gonna save it. But <laughs> put, um, put yes. a pin in it. 
put a pin in that because I'm going to talk about that later. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I did that for a couple days and Bavaria cool. is beautiful. Holy cow, it's so pretty. It's like the Alps and it's just like fairy tale world. And yeah. then hopped on a train back up uh, to to Essen and then did, did Essen. So I played yeah. tourist a little right before. Yeah, we did too. Um, so we ended up flying out to Amsterdam because oh nice yeah every time we go to Essen so this is my this was my third time to Essen Mm -hmm. we went in 2019 uh once because I was in two of my good friends weddings that were like three weeks apart in Philly the Mm -hmm. second one was in October and after so much traveling back and forth to Philly that year I was like, let's do something for us slash me yeah. <laughs> and yeah, go to this and I mean, crazy me. board game convention I heard of. Yeah. So, so that cool. was, I. so I went in 2019 and that was just pre me yeah. working with BGG. But when we did that trip, we flew into Paris, trained to Essen, did Essen for two days. And then we went to Munich mm-hmm. and went to cool. Neuschwanstein. Neuschwanstein. I don't know that yeah. I'm saying exactly right, but it means like new swan, new swan castle. Okay. Okay. Schloss, Schloss Neuschwanstein. Hopefully, I'm saying it. it's close, y'all. It's close, yeah, okay? It's, I, think. I mean, it sounded familiar to me, so I think you got it. <laughs> I think you got it. Thank but you. anyway, then last year we did uh, Berlin. We had never been to Berlin, so we yeah, went into cool. Berlin, and then we went to Essen. So this mm-hmm. year we were like, let's go to Amsterdam, because I heard so many people talking about, number one, like it's a short train uh, train ride yeah. to Essen, but also just really beautiful. And it was super yeah. beautiful. Um, the like just walking around, seeing the canals, like we did a yeah. canal cruise and everything. No oh, cool. Uh, another cool thing was at I think when I was at Gen Con, I was talking to David Turtsy, mm-hmm. and I mentioned that I that we were coming out that way. He's like, "Oh, you should come come over and play some games." So we ended up taking a train. I forget the area that uh, he lives in, but it's somewhere in the Netherlands. Him and uh, Nora Lee. And uh, we got to meet their baby boy, Zen. Aww. He's super cute. He made an appearance at Spiel one day also. Aww. And uh, yeah, so we went and hung out with them, played That's a couple cool. games. That was, it was really cool. And uh, it was also cool to like, you know, it's always cool to talk to people who live there. Um, because Nora was able to give us a bunch of food recommendations. <gasps> yeah. And, and the next day, we were on a mission. And we were like, we have to eat all of these things. These so the we things just walked eating. around yes. eating. And yeah, so ate way too much. Ate way too say, much. But I really great food. Basically nothing but bread while I was in Germany. They have like it's the so best good. bread. It's, it's so, good. so good. And the pretzels, like you can't. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I will take that giant soft pretzel. Thank you. <laughs> the everything. I ate yeah. so much bread and I loved every moment of it. Yeah. At every opportunity you can get bread there. It's so good. Yeah. Ugh, lo- lots of like really good eats. Um, but yes. like besides like like kind of seeing all the board games I could, I w- it was just I love bumping into people and talking to people and seeing people you don't get to see all the time. Yes. Like I met a bunch of designers for the first time this year and I, I saw like it was great to see some of the ones I met last year. Mm-hmm. Um but this year, I was like randomly bumped into one of the designers of Mindbug, uh, Christian <gasps> cool. Kudal. Yeah, we were just like walking in together and somehow got talking. I think he recognized me. and But then he mentioned Mindbug, and I was like, I bought that at Gen Con. Haven't played it yet, but that's cool. So he's one of the designers like, of that. That's so cool. I don't know if you met Min and Elwin, the designers of Lost Ruins of Arnak. I don't think so. They were at the CGE booth, and uh, so I got to talk to them. They're really sweethearts. So cool. One thing about Essen is I do feel like there are more designers there, and maybe that's just because it's in Europe and a lot of them are designers are yeah. based there, and it's easier for them to get there. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah. I that's- think Essen has, if you want to meet designers, like, you know, like I didn't run into them, but you know, I know people who like met Stefan Feld at Essen and met Reiner yeah. Knizia. And I'm like, that's so cool. Yeah. I, I'm not going to lie. I briefly locked eyes with Reiner Knizia and it blew my mind a little bit. <sighs> uh, we, we, it was a weird thing where 
I maybe was a little starstruck and <laughs> couldn't just go say, hello, I'm Candace, you yeah. know? Hi, so instead I great. looked, he looked like, oh, you look familiar. And then he, like we were kind of crossing paths um, for a meeting. Anyway, mm-hmm. that was that was actually a really cool highlight. That's cool. I met Paulo Mori. <gasps> so cool. That was cool. And it's like people like Paulo Mori, I don't know what like half these designers look like. So yeah. thankfully he stopped me as I was walking by and was like, hey, I'm Paulo Mori. And I'm like, ah, that's, that's so, so cool. cool. Yeah, because, yeah, we don't know what a lot of them look like, right? Yeah. So well, we know their names. We know their right. games. We know their but names really well. We don't well. necessarily have their like – author picture on the box right so yeah. maybe i met a bunch of designers at essen and i have no idea hey if you're listening to this and you're a game designer and i met you at essen hey let me know <laughs> i didn't i didn't realize exactly Canicia is like yeah we did meet and you didn't realize you didn't know it was me and you're like oh that's oh, who you were that's oh, why you're wearing that bow tie <laughs> exactly and then uh, I also met Oda, who's uh, one of the designers of La Granja, Cooper oh. Island designer, and also the new 2023 Spiel release, Plant a New Bow. Yeah. Awesome dude. Did you get a chance to meet him? I did not. Okay. He's- I don't think I've met any I, – I, I don't think I met any cool designers. You probably did, but you didn't know who they were. I'm sorry to them. <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe it's because we didn't see each other and I was happening I was like you on were the where path all the designers the were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I met a lot of awesome people. I'll just I'll just say that. Um one other highlight I'll mention was uh Helga Ostertag, who's one of the designers of Terra Mystica, Age of cool. Innovation, Gaia Project, heck yeah. Uh Farron Renalius, who's one of the designers of Lacrimosa. <gasps> oh, I like Lacrimosa. Yep, yep. And he had uh, two designs he had uh, for New for Spiel, 1902 Meliese and the Battle of Versailles. Did you get any of those? No. Of those? Well, you're no, lucky because I, I have them and we live in the same city. <gasps> yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and Danny Garcia. Uh, I still have not played Barcelona, but um, I got a copy of Arborea, mm-hmm. which is a new one. Danny Garcia was like a new is a new designer but has all these games coming out like he has another one coming from board and dice next year there's a like i feel like there are like four games on the horizon and he just kind of came out of nowhere which is like really cool. it's like here's a bunch of games like that's cool <laughs> yeah some people are just always working on a million things uh, yeah. Like their brains are full of designs and then they just like vomit them out you know that's yeah why I picture game design works people usually just vomiting (laughs) Vomiting prototype pieces yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) so okay i also want to mention outside of designers Mm -hmm. i i bumped into a lot of bgg podcast listeners Mm -hmm. who are super cool cool. stop me say hi really nice things and i even got to play games with two of them um which i i would consider them friends at this point roberto from montreal and roman from France and uh Roman was super kind and gave me a copy of this French trick taking game called oh, cool. La Batard because he knows I love trick taking games and it's supposed to be really good and nice. I can't wait to try it. Yeah. Oh, I love trick taking games too. Yeah. Did you well we'll wait. We'll wait on that. There's a hot trick taking game. I I can't uh, wait to hear what you're thinking. <laughs> that, uh, I did a couple I did a few little trick taking things I want to talk about um when we talk about games awesome. that stuck out to us. But um, I, I I can't wait. Well, do you like do you like um climbing shedding games? Yeah, yes. Okay, because I also got a chance to hang and play a couple games with Jonathan Cox from John Gets Games. And <gasps> I heard he John has... Gets Games was there, and we were yeah. like, we didn't the... see him. We didn't see him Aww. at all. Aww. That would have been so cool. I'd like to meet him. Yeah, he's so cool. And he's designed two games, uh, which he had prototypes for. How and cool. And I got the opportunity to play them. They're both climbing shedding games. One's called Peaks and Valleys. Mm-hmm. And it had this like clever mechanism where everybody plays a card at the beginning, secretly mm-hmm. flip them over. And that kind of dictates the how the points are going to be awarded oh, cool. for the round. Then the other one was spring cleaning. And the thematically, you're trying to get rid of clutter in your house. 
and you're dumping stuff on your front lawn, which means you have cards in front of you that other players can play to make like combos to like shed their hand. But you want people to like kind of take yours so that I almost punched my water glass over there. I gotta <laughs> calm down, Candace, calm down. Um, but then and the, the cards for spring cleaning, his wife got um, this art commissioned of their dog. So every card is like their oh. dog doing, because I guess their dog kind of interferes whenever they're trying to clean the house, you know? Oh my so gosh. She got art commission on all the cards. It's super cute. Um, but yeah, what did you? Happen to see any like really like unique looking booths or anything? Yeah, um, I did actually. I'm re- realizing just in case they're listening, people are gonna be like, You did meet me, I'm a designer, and you met me. <laughs> um, I'm like, Wait, I did meet two designers. Uh, I met the designer of Romy Rami. Did you check that one out? It's a I Randolph played it at game. Gen Con, I love um, it. It was so fun. I came home with yeah. a copy of it. Yeah. Uh, so he was there when we were doing our demo, which was really fun. That's and cool. And then um, the designer, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to have to look up his name, but um, the designer of uh, Taiwan Night Market and um, Vegetable Stocks, cute little card game. Yes. And Christmas Tree. Uh, we were at that. It's the Taiwan um, game, game games. design group. Yes. I believe. I think so. Um, and I, I, so I was running around the whole convention with Matthew Jude. So Matthew and I were there and uh, they came over and started talking to us. And then we were like, we're interested in this game. And this, a woman working at the booth came to like give us the demo. And the designer of the game was like, wait, I designed this. She should basically was like, no, 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 no. I will show them this. And I was like, OK, cool. I'll take the, That's um, cool. the demo from the designer. So those were t- I did meet two designers and they were awesome. Did you bump into a lot of like content creators? I uh, had a great moment. Um, so Simi Co-op, um, uh, we were uh, demoing. I was with some friends demoing Tipperary, which was super fun. And like, you know how uh, when you're at a demo table, sometimes people come over and like pick up the game box and look at, look at right. it and kind of look right. over your shoulder so they can kind of get a feel for the game. So someone comes over and picks up the box and is looking and we all look up and they look down and it's semi co-op. And it says, and we're all like, oh, whoa, we didn't <laughs> even really, like, we know you and you know us. And it was, and so we That's were like, do you want cool. a demo with us? Um, so that was great. And uh uh, Amy and Maggie from Thinker Themer. I was yeah. so glad on the last day we ran into each other and got to sit and talk a little bit. And that was so They're lovely. So They're sweet. so nice. Um, they were another set of people that I bumped into multiple times. Oh, nice. Which I always, which I always love seeing them. And we got to demo a game together. Oh, fun. Oh, uh, I met yeah. um, Efka and Elaine. From oh, cool. no pun included. I, I didn't see them at all. I was like, I'm pretty sure F and Elaine are here. Uh, but I didn't see it. S- I saw them at their hotel, so not at oh, the show. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I happened to be playing games at their hotel and I had a really lovely chat with them and that was really cool too. Cause yeah, you know you know all these people yeah. from the internet. <laughs> right, yeah. So it's You're cool like, to wait, be in I person. Recognize you or we've interacted we a little friends? bit and you get to like yeah. see. Yeah, exactly. Wait a minute. <laughs> Are we? And then you get to talk to him in real life and you can be like, okay, yes, cool, we are. Good, 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 good. <laughs> but yeah, did you see any like impressive booths or anything? Yeah, so there was out? one section, it was actually in Hall 3, and I was trying to remember. I was looking back, I opened up the SN Spiel app on my phone to go into like the map section to yeah. try and figure out what booth it was. And maybe you saw this as well and can help me remember. I think it was part of the Pegasus Spiel area, but I... I might be wrong. This was actually um, some TTRPG stuff. Um, and it was in Hall 3, which is okay. not the RPG hall. But it was like these little like little cubicles. Um, huh. And they had themed. So you could do a demo of maybe... <sighs> The thing is, is it was... I'm trying to remember like the games that were there. They were demoing um, the Avatar The Last Airbender... RPG, I which it. I know is like Magpie Games and um, a bunch of other ones kind of like that. And so each uh, cubicle was like themed okay, for the okay, theme of cool. 
whatever the, the RPG. RPG. So you could go in there. It was just one table. Sit down with, you know, whoever, I guess, a demoer who is going to, like, be your GM for your little short demo scenario and be surrounded by things that makes it feel like you're in the world of Avatar The wow. Last Airbender or that you're in the cyberpunk whatever, you know, like, and I was just like, this is so, such a cool little immersive feeling That's uh, to have really these little cool. themed cubbies basically that you could sit and try the game in. And I thought that, I wish I could remember more yeah, details about who, if you're listening to this, <laughs> Send me a geek mail and tell me if you know what the heck I'm talking about. But um, <laughs> yeah, anybody, and, anybody, anyone, please. <laughs> um, the other one, and this is just because I love it. I love this booth. So the Gerhard's booth. So Gerhard oh. is a company that does really lovely wooden abstract strategy games. So they have like crokinole boards, for example, um, games like that, and. It's not that the booth itself is necessarily like super themed out or super decked out because it, they're abstract strategy games. They're not, right. they're, you know, like what they're <laughs> themed out their booth, but they just have all the games out. They're on display. They look beautiful. And I went through, we went through and we're like, had this one lovely, I think his name was Dominic, a uh, demoer. Uh, and so he, like, he like takes, you know, a minute to explain this game. You play it in about five and then you're like, and now we want to play this one. And he'd come back over and explain that one. And we just went from That's game so to cool. game to game and played a whole bunch of them. And they're just, I just really enjoy it. And they just are like keepsakes, you know, like you just want to yeah. buy them and then you, you hold on to them and, and your great grandkids are going to inherit them one day. You know, like I just think it's really yeah. nice. So I love that booth. I'm so sad I did not. I might have seen that booth from afar, but I really mm. wanted to get the a game that Eric Martin told me about called Triad. 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 Yes, I was there when he was. So we, oh. Matthew and I had just demoed that and we're moving on to another one when he came over and we were like, oh, we just played that. I can explain the rules to you. So we helped <laughs> um, answer a couple of rules questions, which was oh. funny. Yeah, it's really cool. It's got these cool. um, dice that are numbered. They're D6s, but they're numbered one to three. And you like roll them to start. You each have your own. So it's two player. And you place them on your board um, from lowest to highest, one to three. And then you're just... Uh, on your turn, you rotate the die to a new value, and then that's the number of spaces you can move it, and you're trying to get sets of all the same that's number cool. next to each other or sequential, so one, two, and three. But it has to include at least one of your opponent's dice in the set, uh, and then cool. you're basically trying to do that three times. And it's just, like, tricky and quick yeah. and thinky and lovely and I it's wanted great. to get it. Yeah. I wanted to get it. I, that was one. That was one that got away. But there are a couple I'll probably mention later. But uh, I, I loved the uh, board and dice booth. Uh, so they were all decked out for Nucleum, and yeah. everyone had like green hair, and they kind of oh, had like so almost cool, like yeah. steampunk outfits yeah. on. There were pipes with green lights, and yeah. I thought that was like really really cool. And uh, eye catching. I also like one other one that kind of looked neat was uh, there was a I think in Hall, uh, I don't know I yeah, I which one it was. Maybe six. There's a Nightmare Before Christmas take over the holidays, and I uh, missed that. Well, it was like I, that's why I think it's six or something because it was yeah, like, like <laughs> deep in the back. But it had, you know, there were pumpkins and they had all of the tables that were out had these chairs that have this like haunted house looking oh, like cool. they all look like they were in a haunted house. And they had the uh, what is the guy Jack from Nightmare yeah, uh -huh. Before Christmas on the backs of them. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll stop that's and take a cool. picture of it. Yeah. 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 So did you have any um, I know you demoed a lot of games uh, as did I did any of them kind of stand out? You know what one demo, well, other than the two where I got to kind of be given the demo mm -hmm. by the designer, which is always really cool. And that was Romy Rami and Christmas Tree were the two that that happened. Um, uh, one that just felt really unique <laughs> was the demo for Mlem. 
Mel. I don't know that. Mom. So it was the one. Uh, it's uh, a new uh, Reiner Knizia game. Um, and it's oh. got the space cats on the cover. Oh. So I guess Mlem is kind of like another word for like blep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and it's all about cats going to space. And okay. it's a push your luck dice rolling game. Um, but all the cats are... Uh, all the all the things in space are themed after cats. So you're like going up in space and you might be trying to land on the planet that's made out of yarn or the <laughs> Milky Way, right? Because it's milk yeah. or um, the, the scratching post planet. So it looks that's like, you know, that cute. Car- and it's just like <laughs> themed so well and it's so cute and like you're rolling these dice and we had a really <laughs> lovely demoer um, who I I think their name was Aria, if I'm not mistaken. Um, really lovely demoer to show us all the stuff. And then <laughs> one thing that I really like about demos at Essen is um, usually they explain the game to you and then they leave and you get to just play the, play game, the game, right? And then they're yeah. there if you have questions, but we're playing the game and we've got, we're almost to the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> and Arya suddenly comes back and goes, oh, uh, turns out I taught you a rule wrong. This dice, you get to keep. And then like, uh, bye. Like dropped this whole new rule. Like, actually, uh, you should be doing it this way. Bye. And then like ran off. And it was the funniest way to come in and do a correction. And we were all like, that's great. Oh, cool. Well, that changes things. But also... We've been who, you know, like who cares? We were all playing it the same way, slightly wrong. And then we started playing it the rest of the way with the correct rule. And we're like, oh, yeah, I can see how that changes things. It was just so (laughs) funny to have them come over and be like, oh, by the way, it's actually this. See ya. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) So I enjoyed that. Uh, That style of correction was pretty great. (laughs) That's funny. So I um I ended up doing a demo. You're talking about demos with designers. Yeah. Uh, I I demoed uh, San Core, which is a upcoming yeah. Osprey release. That's got a beautiful cover. Holy oh yeah, cow. it's Ian O'Toole. You know. Ugh, uh, can I tell yeah. you, Ian O'Toole, you are talented. <laughs> yes. That's all. So I'll say. <laughs> so talented. Um, but uh, San Core is designed by Fabio Lopiano. And Mandela Fernandez Grandin, and they were both there demoing so cool. the game. And I had an hour and a half demo session, and it was great because they kind of set it up so that each of us had a built in strategy, like the way they oh, dealt cool. us our starting cards and everything. And so they taught the game by having us each just like kind of jump in and take turns. Uh, this is this is a basically a medium, maybe medium heavy, a little bit Euro game for one to four players where you are managing the prestigious University of San Corre in the 14th century, Timbuktu. Your goal is basically to spread knowledge throughout West Africa. And throughout the game, you are basically enrolling students and teaching classes and you're graduating the students, like you're bumping them up these, these uh, tracks. Mm-hmm. And um, then you're adding more classes to your curriculum and you're filling the great library with books. And that is very important because the books determine how you score points. Oh, interesting. So in this game, you have like four different disciplines, theology, law, mathematics, and astronomy. And each is associated with a color. And there are books that you'll get throughout the game. And like when like when you're going to add a a class to your curriculum, you will put a book in the library to take a matching type of class. And the way it works is the library is three rows, like three shelves that you're mm-hmm. going to put books on. And when you put a book up, you can put it on any of the rows and you just put it in, you know, next, the next open slot, I guess. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the game, you're going to evaluate each row for like almost like area majority. So if I have mostly blue books in the top row, uh, blue are going to be worth two points. So mm-hmm. every, I should say blue stars. So throughout the game, you're collecting different color stars. Okay. And depending on how many of the different book colors are on each row in the library, 
it's telling you if the books are worth two, one, or nothing, maybe. And so maybe if I have majority blue books on three rows, uh, blue stars are going to be worth six points at the end of the game, which is kind of cool. Um, And there was one weird thing that kind of tripped us up, (laughs) and it's that when there's a tie, so let's say I have two blue books and two orange books on one row, the tiebreaker is whoever got to two books first. Mm. So it's not necessarily the one who placed in the far left slot. It's right. whoever has two books there first mm-hmm. would break the tie. Um, but yeah, it was really cool. Like the board is like you have these different areas of the boards that are kind of corresponding to the different disciplines. And, you know, they all are almost like little mini games Mm -hmm. Um, that you're doing and you have different things that you'll be able to get to kind of build up your engine. So when you take a certain action in an area, maybe you get to do bonus actions. Um, There's a lot going on, but at the same time, it felt like really intuitive as we started getting into it. And I think it's going to be a really good release. Um, It looks like Merv, which I never played, but, but I don't think they're very similar okay <laughs> like i think there there are some similarities but the gameplay is um pretty different uh, but i i enjoyed it and i can't wait to actually like play like, a full game of it properly you know? play yeah yeah cool but it was cool and it was cool to learn from the designers that always yeah that's always very cool <laughs> yeah and so like when i go to essen i'm always excited when i discover games that I didn't even yes. know existed mm-hmm. until I got there. So did you have any like discoveries like that where you found something there and you're like, oh, this is yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Well, one is the trick-taking game that I alluded to earlier. Oh, we which, put a pin in it. Yeah. Yeah, we put a pin, <laughs> on, pin in it. And now it's time to take that pin out. Um, <laughs> so this is one that I actually had seen on the Pre- BGG preview list for us and was like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting because I basically marked all the trick taking games. Uh huh. Cool. But this one also sounded interesting because it's it's called Rebel Princess, and this ended up being, as far as I could tell, a little bit of a, a hot game of the con, which was very exciting. They sold out very quickly of this game, and they wow. were this tiny tiny booth. Um, the company is called Zombie Paella games they are from spain um and their booth was really small like room for like one like two small little demo tables and that's it and they were like it was one of those things where like hey if you want to get in a demo you need to like the day that we went and got the demo was like the first thing we did i was like okay first thing we're going to this booth because otherwise i don't think we're going to get a demo in and we at that point, I knew we couldn't even buy the game because it had been sold out for like two days already at the convention. And I was like, this is ah. crazy. Like, I don't know this company. I've never heard of them. I don't know this game. But it was so lovely. It's so interesting. So in Rebel Princess, you are princesses. So everyone gets an identity. Um, and the art is so... I might have to look up the artist um, to tell you because the art is so cool. I really love it. Um, so everyone gets an identity of a different princess. So you might be, they're all plays on like Snow White or the princess in the pea or Cinderella, like, um, but they're all slightly different, but you know, that's what they're referring to. And your princess has a special ability. So mine was once per, per round, Um, and you play four rounds. Once per round, I could exhaust my ability to take a card from another player and swap it with one of mine. Um, And then someone else had an ability where once per round, they could win a trick and then choose to have someone else lead the next Ah. trick rather than have to lead themselves. That's cool. Um, Someone else had a power of they could say for any of their cards that they played that were value seven or less, they could say this is a zero, actually, because you could choose to lose huh. because you don't necessarily want to win tricks in this game. Because in this game, you are a princess who does not want to get married. And what's happening nice. in each of the tricks basically is it's a festival and a lot of princes are going to show up. 
<laughs> and these Prince Charmings are going to try and offer you marriage proposals, and you don't want them. So if Trick you end up winning <laughs> tricks with princes in them, they have these little, like, skull symbols on the bottom. <laughs> and the skull symbols are points, but you want the lowest score possible at the end of ah. the game. And then you also have... um a frog prince so he looks like a frog but he's a prince in disguise and he has like five skulls on him so you really don't want that card and then every round um you flip over a card that gives you a slightly new rule so it's like okay so in this one for every queen card that you win that match that pairs up with a prince card your prince points are doubled because the queens mm. really want you to get married. Uh, okay, in the next round, uh, it's a party, so you have to bring gifts. So in that round, we all had to play a face-down card first and then play the trick. So whoever oh, won cool. got whatever the face-down cards were. Yeah. Um, so every <laughs> round is different, and there's a ton of those cards. So every game you play is going to have all this variability. Um, so it really made it feel like, a new and interesting way to do trick taking with incredibly charming art. And I loved the theme. It was so fun. And I'm hoping at some point um, that I'm going to be able to get a copy of Rebel Princess because I really enjoyed it. Guess so who has a copy, Paula? <gasps> you have one? I got it. Yeah. You? I didn't skunk. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't demo it, but uh, my. So I, I don't I don't remember if it was uh, Ryan and Patrick from the Trick Talkers podcast. Yeah, but I hit them up and I hit up T Taylor Reiner before uh, before going mm -hmm. to S and I'm like, what should I look out for? And one of them told me Rebel Princess. Yes, so I have a copy. I'll invite you over. Yes, you it's over. We'll good. Play. It's cool. Good. It sounds really yeah. cool. I like that it a lot. Really cool. Um, and then I had this other, I'm going to talk about my other one. My other exciting yeah. discovery is another trick-taking game called, I'm not, I know I'm not saying this exactly right. This is in German, but it's like stitch for stitch, stick for stick for stick. I don't know, stitch for stitch. I don't know how you say it in German. Okay. But, <laughs> and I don't know what it means in English either, but it's basically uh, if trick-taking and clue were a game. So it's like deduction trick-taking. So... You have – it's it's like kind of brain breaking um, and I felt for our demoer. Uh, at one point, he was talking to us and he was like – we were all like, oh, we get it. And he was like, oh, you're the first group today who <laughs> understood that on the first try. Um, so you have – everyone has almost like – guess who kind of tiles you know nice. so you've got like yeah, four yeah. tiles and um four of them have identities like people suspects um and then a bunch of them have weapons and so your cards are different identities and those are basically like your suit the identity is the suit and then they all of course have a value on them and then they all also have a weapon on them okay. um and when you play the cards in the trick uh basically there's two different levels of trump so the weapon is the highest trump so if that weapon is the murder weapon any card with that weapon on it is going to beat any other card uh. if that's not present then you look at the character on the card if the character on the card is the murderer then that card is now a trump and oh, if like, neither of those things are true, you just look at the values. Okay. Hmm. So that's how you figure out tricks. But how do you know, how does all this work with deduction? So one of right. you each round knows the answer. You have randomly chosen from the tiles a murderer and a weapon. And so whenever a trick is played, you, as the person who knows the answer, has to then say to everyone else, this is the card that wins. And then everyone oh. else has to figure out from that who the murderer is and what the weapon. That's so cool. at the end of every trick, they take two of their tiles, a murderer tile and a weapon tile, and they show it to you as their guess. And you have to say either yes, both of those are right, or no. If one of them is right, but the other one is wrong, you say no, it's not right. And if you are the person who knows the information, you get points based on the number of tricks it takes for people to figure it out. And if you're the person guessing, you get points based on... uh 
the number of cards you have left in your hand when you figure it out. And ah. so you play, it's four players, you play four rounds, so everyone gets a chance to be the person who knows the information. And it's so brain breaking and so <laughs> interesting. And I love deduction and I love trick taking. And did you I, get it? I did not pick it up mostly because I have very limited suitcase space. Okay. okay. And also I'm very much hoping it will come out in North America at some point. So okay. I'm just going to be keeping an eye on it for the future because I really want it. <laughs> That's cool. That one was yeah. actually on my list to check out, but I never got around it to was, seeing it. Yeah, Stish for Stish. Uh, uh, let me look up. I should actually look up the designers for both of these games because I didn't write them down. But <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, uh, really, really cool and fun. Cool. So the designer of Rebel Princess, there's... Four names listed here. Daniel Byrne, Jose Gerardo Guerrera, Kevin Pelez. I have not said your name right. I'm sorry, Kevin. And Terso Vergos. Stitch for Stitch is designed by Marcus W. Leon. Okay. The publisher is Zoc Verlag. I really hope it comes out. Yeah. hope I can find I, it. Yeah, I, I had this uh, a similar thing where you have to be conscious of suitcase space. Yeah. And uh, and also just lack of time to see everything. But I this was on my list that I was supposed to check it out. Um, but w one of the games that I kind of uh, didn't even know was coming out. Um, I actually funny you were talking about Christmas tree. I was demoing Christmas tree in whatever hall fall, hall four. I think that was hall four. Yeah, I think you're right. Yep. And um, near just behind me was Explore 8's booth. And Explore mm -hmm. 8 is the company that released Federation last year. Oh, yeah. And so I know Anne Catherine there, and she's, she happened to see me, and she's like, oh, Candace, you have to come over and check this out. And I was like, okay. So I go over, and I just and I play this, I do a demo for this game of, uh, it's called Fruto Play. Mm -hmm. And this is a brand new 2023 release. It's, de it's designed by Romeric, uh, Galanier and it's and Luke Raymond, who is so the two of them designed Splitto, which okay, I've never yeah. played, but I it looked like something mm -hmm. people know about <laughs> besides me. And <laughs> um and then Luke Raymond designed Sky Team. Oh, Sky which, Team's cool. Super yeah. cool, super cool. So I was kind of, you know, just discovered that that was the same designer. But this is um I would say a card game with trick-taking DNA. Mm -hmm. It's not a straight-up trick-taking game, but you have four suits of cards, and they're they have this like <laughs> cute artwork that's fruit, <laughs> but they're like fruit musicians. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's where the name Fruto Play comes from. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but anyway, they four suits of cards, and at the beginning of the game, seven are splayed, or the beginning of each round, seven are splayed. Um, mm -hmm. in the center of the table. And that's representing the seven cards that are going to lead seven tricks for the round. So you'll take the first card and put it out and say, okay, this is like the lead card. And maybe it's a five banana yellow card. And everybody has a hand of cards and you are going to pick a card. So it's simultaneous card selection, mm -hmm. put it face down. Once everybody has a card played face down, you reveal them. Whoever is close has the closest number of the banana suit wins. So meaning if if the banana card, what did I say it was a five yellow. Mm -hmm. If I play a seven and you play a one and we both happen to play bananas, um, I would win because I'm closer to the five. Cool. Now you don't have to play bananas. You can play whatever card you want. And another twist is that Let's say if the card, uh, the lead card is the five, mm -hmm. I play the seven, you play a three, we're both two apart, mm -hmm. we cancel each other out if we were the closest. Oh, and then the next closest would, would win. get it. Yeah. And if nobody plays a banana, then just the closest number wins. Okay. Following those same rules. So if you win the trick, you take the cards and you start putting them into like a tableau mm -hmm. where you're you're basically um, splaying them as sets. So all, all my yellow cards in one column, all my red cards, but so you can see 
all of them because in the top left corner of every card, you're going to have an icon for the fruit, uh, which is representing a points value. Um, so some cards will just have a single fruit, like a single banana, and then some of the numbers will have two bananas on one card. So mm -hmm. you're playing, and then the people who didn't win the trick will draw a new card. So you play seven tricks this way, and then at the end of seven tricks, all the cards remaining in your hand get played into your tableau. The way it scores is such that you take whatever column of fruit you have the most points in, mm -hmm. um, so the most banana icons, times whichever column you have the least points in. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so maybe if my apple column, I have only two, but my bananas, I got seven, I get 14 points for the round. Now, if you're really good, you'll manage to you maybe- got them all even. <laughs> or maybe just get one, yeah, that or get only one column. So if you're only scoring, if you manage to only score one column, it multiplies by itself. That's cool. So then every um, every suit has a 13, which is a rotten fruit. Oh, so no. if you end up <laughs> taking a rotten fruit into your tableau, that means at the end of the round before scoring, you have to get rid of the rotten fruit and another card from that column. So sometimes that can bite you in the butt. Sometimes it yeah. can save you because if you had like a column where you only had, you know, two banana cards and one is the rotten fruit and you could get rid of that. And then now your you know, lowest number is four. Better, which exactly. times four times. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that sounds so, so interesting. It, it is really, really fun. So I demoed it. I just played a round of it because I think I had to go to a meeting mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then, um, and Catherine gave me a copy and there's a play mat that they had oh, for it cool. too. You could get a bundle. So she hooked me up with, uh, everything, which was super nice. Nice. Um, so later that day I ended up teaching it to other people <laughs> and then I ended up another time playing, uh, with my friend Roman from France. We ended up playing, I ended up playing this game four times before I left Essen. Wow. And then I bumped into good. Sunday when I was wandering around, just making sure, you know, trying to check out things before it was like the end of the show, mm -hmm. bumped into Amy and Maggie. And I was like, you got to try this game. So we went back and we played a game. I played a game with them nice. and they ended up <laughs> buying it because they liked it. So, um, yeah, so it was just this kind of surprise game that I didn't yeah. I didn't even have on my radar, but I definitely recommend checking it out. Like I said, it's not like fully trick taking, mm -hmm. but it's definitely like sort of trick taking. Cool. You know? Yeah. So that one's Fruto Play. But then speaking of uh Roman, who mm -hmm. is my new friend from France who loves trick taking <laughs> games and he makes some great recommendations. He was like, I gotta show you this game. And this game was called Far Away. Mm -hmm. And this is a 2023 release designed by Johannes Goopy and Corentin Lebrat. Hopefully I got close with those names. Apologies, We're doing apologies. our best, everyone. We are doing our best. We're trying. And We're it's tired. <laughs> we are. I just looked at myself in the camera you. and was like, wow, I look tired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is published by Catch Up Games and... So again, uh, this is a card game. This is not a trick taking game, but it is, uh, I guess, a tableau builder. Um, mm -hmm. You have these small square cards and the deck goes from one to 68. So every card has a unique number on it. Everybody will get three cards, I think, to start. And we are each going to pick one card, put it face down, simultaneously reveal. The card that we picked, we play into our tableau. Then we're going to do that eight times. And mm -hmm. at the end of the game, we're going to score the cards we played. So all your cards are going to be in a row. So the interesting thing, there are a couple twists here, is the last card that you played, so the, you know, slot eight, is the one that you're going to, at the end of the game, score first. So now think of stuff like Furnace, mm -hmm. where you're like running things in an engine. Yeah. You have these cards are some of them are scoring cards, like some of them have resources on them. Mm -hmm. Some of them need resources to be activated. Oh, so you but, need so to you do it in the to, right order. Yes, to, it oh, will break boy. your brain in the best way. It, it's so good. But here's the other twist. So when you play a card, 
you will compare after everyone reveals their cards, you'll compare the cards. I forget if it's the person who plays the highest number or the lowest number, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) you're going to draft a new card. And so there'll be like five cards on the table and you draft them in a certain order based on what you played in relation to the other players. Then if the card you played was higher than the one to the left of it, the one you previously played, you get to get one of these small little special cards, these bonus cards. Oh, cool. And when you get a bonus card, they're awesome for several reasons. One is because they're in effect for all of your cards. So meaning when you score that very first card, Mm -hmm. if you need certain resources, maybe these bonus cards have those resources. So that's really cool. And there's a certain icon that you'll have maybe on your tableau of cards that says every time you get to get one of those little bonus cards, you may get to draw. Like I got to the point where I was drawing four of them. Keep one. So at the beginning of the game, you always draw one, but you're like building up an engine with what card you play. Mm -hmm. But the only way you get one of those is if you play a higher card number than the previous one. Uh, so it, oh, it's, boy. I think it that was, would trigger my analysis paralysis real bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. And it's definitely a game where, like, and, and I think Roman even said it. He's like, people are going to get this wrong. Like, mm-hmm. you, you, you are scoring from the, the last card backwards. And certainly, um, Roberto, he was like, when we went to start scoring, he was like, Oh crap, I did it the opposite way. Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> but I I really, really enjoyed this game so much. It was the first thing I went to get the next day, and I was so sad that it was sold out. <gasps> oh. <sighs> that was the one that got like, away. No. I need to get a copy of this. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. This is my rebel princess for you. Like yes. this is I And unfortunately I, I wish I could say that I ended up with a copy of Far Away that we could play oh, together, but I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been it would have been nice though, because then I'm be like, I'll bring it and we'll have a Rebel yeah. Princess Far Away night. But that would be so sadly cool. no. Well, I'm gonna I'm on a mission to get it. So when I get it, we will have a game night. I think yes. we should. Now that I know you yes. like trick taking games too, I have I a love million of them. them. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, this game was really, really cool. Awesome brain burner. I love the art on the cards mm-hmm. and just trying to, you know, maximize your scoring, make sure you have the resources in the right position so that your cards can actually score and everything. Ah, anyways, uh, did you get to play any games? Like, I know some of your demos, you were able to like demo a whole game, but were there mm-hmm. any games that you played for the first time at Spiel that you want to mention? Yeah, I'll just quickly mention two. So one is General Orders, which is from Osprey yes. Games by David Thompson, who, of course, has designed, um, along with Trevor Benjamin, the Undaunted series and a bunch of other games. And I actually, at Gen Con, saw General Orders and David got David to give me like an overview of the game, but I didn't oh, have yeah. time to actually play it. So, I have a picture of you too. That's right. Yeah, it was that. great. Uh, so I was like, uh, I knew it was a game that Matthew, Jude, and I would enjoy because it's it's two player, kind of um, war themed worker placement, and something that David Thompson and and Trevor Benjamin, because they they design together a lot, um, are great at doing are making like war games that are a great bridge from for board gamers who don't play war games, war games if that makes right. sense. And, um, you know, because like the Undaunted series is like, it's like a deck builder, you know, and this is, you yep. know, like, this is worker placement. You've got, it's really great too because it's in the small box <laughs> and yes. uh, it's not, <laughs> someone pointed out uh, to me actually, one thing that's great about it is you don't, it's World War II, but you don't know what side you're playing. It's not indicated yeah. on any of the art or on the board. So it's a little abstract. Yeah, it's, way, it, which is nice. kind of nice to have it abstracted yeah. like that. And you have uh, different hexes. And basically, you have on your side of the board your um, home base, your headquarters. And on the other side of the board, you've got uh, your opponent's headquarters. And you're just trying to work your cubes, your troops, into their headquarters, basically, to win. And you have generals. And the generals are a different shape from your cubes. They're like octagon cylinder kind of things. Um, And you can place those on different spaces, hexes on the board. And when you do, you cover up uh, a little symbol and that's the action you're activating for that round. So your generals 
or sending out orders to your troops. Um, and so you can reinforce, you can add troops, people that your troops need to be in supply, you can airdrop them in, and then you can like roll dice for your combat to do, and then and what's great is um, you move your troops in and for defense, you have combat. So the person who's defending rolls a die and then the number they get is the number of attacking troops that get removed. And then you're just removing one for one. So you, right, if you're going to attack, right. you need to like go in as buffed as you can. Right. <laughs> um and it's great. It, it doesn't take terribly long to play. Um, again, it's, it doesn't take up a ton of space on your table. I just really like what David Thompson is doing. I really like what he's doing with Osprey Games. And yeah. And the board is double sided too. Yeah. So there's another I side to played it. I the other side yeah. yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, but yeah, yeah. I really it's enjoyed fantastic. that. So I played a game, a new game from uh, Ricky Tata, the, the designer of Coup. Um, oh. has a new game called Accuse. There's an Accuse. exclamation point. <laughs> but it's it's basically a really fun clue-style card <gasps> game. You know, it was, what, it was funny when you were talking about stitch for stitch or yeah. stick for stick. However you um, say it. <laughs> this, yeah, this is a clue-style card game where you have a certain amount of characters, maybe six. You have two different locations, mm-hmm. and you have three weapons, and... There are a certain amount of cards for each. Maybe there are three knives, two guns, something. So everybody at the start of the game gets one. Well, first of all, you put at the top, you know, the the what we're trying to deduce. Mm-hmm. So there's one weapon, one location, and one person. Mm-hmm. Then we all get cards that has one weapon, one location, mm-hmm. one person. And then there are some cards that are going to be like around the board that we mm-hmm. have some public info and we know what's in our hand. And on your turn, you are basically um, placing a card on one section and you're saying, um, you know, uh, I'm playing a gun and somebody can challenge you. Oh, interesting. Or, or, or you could just put a card face down, any card you want. So if someone challenges you and you're if you were right, they have to give you one of their cards. Hmm. If you were wrong, I think you have to give them one or something. I don't remember exactly how it works, mm-hmm. but it's neat. And then the other thing that's cool is you have trap cards. So everybody starts with you know one location, one weapon, one person, but you also have a fourth card, which is a trap card. So if somebody challenges you when you play a trap card, something happens to them, but... The way the game works is you keep taking turns kind of doing this, trying to get some information. And then at any point, you can just pick up this pawn and say, I think I got it. And you Jacques. guess. Yes. You guess. And then you pick up the cards. And if you're right, you won the game. That's if you're wrong, cool. you put the cards down. And now everybody else gets a chance. Do they have to reveal something first? But then it kind of goes around and people can either like flip a card or something and then take a guess. And if they're wrong, oh, it cool. goes around. It's really, really cool. And it's it's another very small box. I like it. it. Was, yeah, it was so great bumping into Ricky. Um, this was on Wednesday, the day before the show opened. Mm-hmm. We were walking around picking up games for the BGG library. And Ricky was like, come on over here. You know, super enthusiastic. And we're like, okay, we'll play. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. down. But yeah, it was really good. Uh, so I ended up buying a copy of that. Yeah. Um, what's another one that you got to play? Yeah, I got to play Tipperary, which I'd mentioned earlier um, when we were talking about running into people. Um, but this is about your building, build an Irish country piece by piece is what the uh, <laughs> the listing here says. The designer is Gunther <laughs> Burkhart and it's published by Lookout Games. And it's a tile polyomino tile lane game, which I love. Cool. And you have your tile selection is a little bit, uh, you know, on Planet Unknown, you kind of have a lazy Susan of uh, tiles and depending on what's in front of you or is the ones you have to choose from. Well, yeah. in this game, you have a spinner. And so uh, you do the spinner and then each end of the spinner has a different color on it. And the one that matches your player color, that's the little depot, basically, that you take two tiles oh. from. You choose which one you want to lay down. The other one goes back and then you you fill it in so everyone has two. So you always have a choice. And you're laying down tiles and it's, you know, just the kind of thing where if you surround your starting board, you get bonus points. Whenever you put a like distillery by a field, 
you produce uh, 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 whiskey. And so you have a little barrel that you move that gets you points. You score for sheep. So whenever you're groupings of sheep who are adjacent to each other, and then you can uh, uh, activate extra sheep that you can add in so that your group of three over here and your group of two, now you add this little sheep meeple and they're connected. So now you have a group of six. You get p- points for having the most sheep. Um, excuse me. Uh, you know, that sort of thing where you're cool, laying yeah. down tiles and activating synergies and scoring points. And it's quick. It doesn't take very long to play. And just cute, lovely. I I liked it a lot. I I really like tile lane games and and I liked this one a lot. Cool. Temporary. Mm. Temporary. I'll just mention really quickly two other ones that mm-hmm. I got the chance to play. One is Evenfall. Um mm-hmm. this is a new release from uh, Stefano De Silvio and it was from DLP Games or just DLP, I don't know, but uh, Aldi had this on um his list for spiel anticipation mm-hmm. he was looking forward to it didn't know too much about it but the little he did tell me about it got me excited about it so yeah i did the whole uh discordia thing where i was like oh let me consume everything yeah, i can about this look game. everything up about it <laughs> yeah and i was i was pretty hype and this was the first game that i bought this and uh pirates of maracaibo because it was the same booth <gasps> nice. i bought these the day before the show open but even fall i got to play it is an engine building tableau builder with with a little bit of worker placement, mm. and each player is a different witch clan. Oh, cool! And uh, yeah, you have double sided boards. You have double sided boards, so you can play like a basic side, or you can play with the asymmetric side. And I was like, guess what, people? We're playing the asymmetric side. Yeah, we are. We're just going there. We're going. We don't need. Look, we're pros. No. We don't need yeah. for your first game. Do this, nah, nah. Let's nah. play it like we it's our tenth this. game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we had tenth game energy that night. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so you are going to be like drafting these places of power, and uh, on your like your player board. This is a skinny player board. You're going to be putting mm-hmm. cards on the right side and the left side. Okay. At the top section is your outer circle, and then below it is your inner circle. So there's a cool thing where when you have cards, when you have places of power and ritual cards on top of them, because you're doing rituals at these places of power, and some of them, when you bind them together, you get these bonuses, but they you're able to harvest resources from the cards up there. But the challenge is you need to move them to your inner circle if you want them to score victory points at the end of the game. Mm. So there's a whole timing thing of when you move certain cards down, you know, because you want to generate that resource engine, but you also want to have enough time to make sure you generate your victory point engine for the end of the game. You also have this coven track that you go up, and when you play the asymmetric side of the boards, Mm -hmm. it's really cool. Everybody's coven tracks are different. And then you can hire specialists, which are cards, multi-use cards that you can either tuck under the bottom and say it's a counselor, or you put to the left side and it's a specialist. Um, they These are all sorts of cr- really cool cards that give you special abilities. Cool. And yeah, it's it's really, really neat. Like So even if there are just four factions with asymmetric factions, which we played three, they all played really differently. And we cool. kind of just like leaned into mm-hmm. what our faction specialty was. But like we were saying at the end of the game, like we had these different strategies going on. It was a very close game. Uh, I ended up winning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think by just like three or five points or so- something. Like it was really mm-hmm. close. And um, uh, Roberto was in the lead for most of the game. And I was like, am I going to be able to catch up? But like, hey, I'm doing something different. Mm-hmm. And it it all worked out. It all worked out in the end. And the fascinating thing to me about it is we could play the same factions again, repeat mm-hmm. the game, and the way the cards come out could change up it's the game change it up. completely. Yeah. So I really liked Evenfall. I'm really looking forward to playing it more. It has really cool art. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't love the texture of the cards. Mm. The cards were like those. I don't know if you've ever felt them. There's some cards lately are like the, that like kind of matte finish. And yeah, they were just yeah, kind yeah, of like yeah. hard to draw and yeah, deal and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. So I have since sleeved them, um, ah, and I'm really, yep, problem solved. <laughs> um, and then the other thing about it is um, you have two types of workers. You have witches and you have elders. Mm-hmm. So there's a central part of the game board where you can do some worker placement, and that's how you're going to get places of power. You're going to be putting witches out there. You can't put your elders out there. 
you can only play elders on cards that are in your inner circle. So some of the cards you can get, mm. the ritual cards give you extra worker placement spaces. But when it's up on your outer circle, only your witches can go there. So that's another reason you might want to try to push your uh, your cards down, transfer them down to your inner circle so you can actually like use your elders and be more efficient with cool. your workers in the game. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, really cool stuff with it. Uh, th so that's Evenfall. I'm looking forward to playing it more. I'm glad that Aldi mentioned it. Yeah. Because I would have missed... Well, I don't know. I think uh, some people are starting to talk about it. Rado, again, yeah. I think had a video on it. But um, it's cool if you like engine building, tableau builder games with some worker placement. And the last one, I'll just throw super fast. Mm -hmm. Wizard's Cup. This is a new game by um, Seiji Kanai, the love letter designer and Jelly oh, Jelly Games. Oh, cool. Yeah. This is like a auto battler game where <laughs> it's really cool. You are each player, like you and I are playing. We mm -hmm. both have a deck of like 18, maybe 24. I don't remember the number of wizards. The okay. same deck. We're going to, at the start of the game, uh, shuffle them. And then you're going to pick one from my stack. I'm going to pick one from your stack. And that's the one that I picked for you. That's your mate, your first wizard on your team. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the one you picked for me is my first wizard. Now we take our other cards, the other 20 cards or however many there are, and we pick five of them in secret. Mm -hmm. So again, we had the same starting deck. Now we have one card and now we're picking five other wizards and trying to like think, hmm, what is Paula going to do? Yeah. And I want to try to pick cards that are going to like go against her wizard team, you know. So then we get our cards. Now we have six of them and we're going to play the game. And to play the game, we're going to put five of those cards in whatever order we want. The sixth card is going to just go below your deck as a sub card. Now, there are a couple cards that interact with the sub card that maybe mm -hmm. let you swap in the sub card. But it's mostly, I think, just to like give some secrecy because after mm. you play the first battle, I'm going to know every card in your deck or right. maybe, maybe I know most of them. But mm -hmm. like with the sub card, you got something secret, you know. Mm. So anyway, they, these cards, like some of them have a weakness. So if we both we both flip a card. If I happen to play a card type that is your weakness, I automatically kill your wizard. Mine stays on the field. You draw another one. Maybe yours is a higher number. You kill my wizard. You know, so it's an auto battler, but it's mm. got some really cool card effects and everything. And um, some people that I played with were saying like they wish if you lose that you could like sub, sub out a, a card. Mm. But I'm like, I think the whole point is a quick game, you know? Yeah. So it's like if your deck is like, super weak and there's no way to recover by like rearranging your cards differently which i think there is sometimes like i think there's a lot of like meta gaming stuff mm -hmm. you can do with like trying to like say oh i know paula has a 10 but when is she gonna play that in her deck because yeah. i want to counteract it with this yeah. card that is the weakness and mm -hmm. ah i like it i like yeah. it so far and it's i feel like there's just like lots more to explore with it yeah just lots of like trying to read the other player right and predict and yeah that's always a yeah. fun dynamic to have in a game so paula i you know how like at spiel there are a lot of games that are like not out yet so that's part yeah. of the fun too it's just like <laughs> discovering games that are coming in the future coming yeah. soon uh what was like did you see any that were like oh i can't wait for that yeah, actually. So I know earlier we were talking about how I went to Neuschwanstein and how much I love Castle of Mad King Ludwig. Well, Blueprints of Mad King Ludwig. Uh, wow. Can you tell I'm getting tired? I'm like trying so hard to <laughs> speak. <Jet> lag. <laughs> um, it was on Kickstarter, I believe, earlier this year, uh, but they had copies of it for demo at Essen. It comes out, I believe it starts fulfilling around the end of this year. Maybe now. I don't know. But okay. it wasn't. I could not buy it at Essen. Um, but it's basically a roll it, a flip and write uh, version of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And so oh, nice. it's the same kind of thing where you have different room types um, where uh, when you complete a room, meaning that you have connected other rooms to all of its open doorways, you get a specific bonus action that happens cool. based on the type of room it is. Um, and then you score points based on which rooms you've finished, um, what they're connected to, bonus cards that you draw during the game. What's cool is in the original Castles of Mad King Ludwig, there is kind of a market system where when you're the master builder, 
all the building tiles that are out, you rearrange them in what they cost in the hopes of putting something that your opponents want very expensive and something you want not too expensive. And that can be a part of the game that some people bounce off of. It can be really hard to figure out how to price Mm -hmm. things properly, but this does not have that at all in it. You choose Ah, the buildings, the rooms you want to add just based on um, player turn order. And the coolest thing about this is because it's blueprints of Mad King Ludwig, uh, your paper that you draw on is this really cool, like semi-translucent paper. And so the colored pencils look really vibrant on it. But also because some of these rooms are weird shapes, because the paper's kind of see-through and it slides into this little like frame that holds it, you can take the card with your shape on it and slide it under your paper Line it up where it needs to be, trace it, and then pull it out and, like, color it in. And it was so clever that they did that. that's cool. Because otherwise, sometimes you're like, I can't draw this. How are you? You're not going to mess it up. either. Yeah. And it comes with a castle eraser, which actually (gasps) erased really well. And (laughs) a castle (laughs) pencil sharpener. And I I really like Roland Wrights, and I love – I I need to get this game when it comes to retail. I need it. I really that enjoyed it. Sounds like your jam. If you love yeah. Roland Wrights and Castles of Mad King yeah. Ludwig, this is your jam. I need it. I need it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's Bezier year- Games. Oh. And I believe also designed, I assume by Ted Alsbach, um, who designed Castles uh, of Mad King Ludwig, but I will confirm that. This year I did not I did not demo that many games that are like future games. For whatever reason, I was you know, just mm-hmm. more in tune with the 2023 stuff yeah. and I guess some of the 2022 stuff. <laughs> but um, one game that I'm really excited about that's going to crowdfunding soon is Nemesis Retaliation. Ooh. Yeah. Awaken Realms. It's designed by Adam Kwapinski. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, He's I'm late got to a the lot party. Of stuff yeah. Uh, right now, oh, yeah. Out. A ton. But I, I'm late to the party with Nemesis. Mm-hmm. I just got into it right after Gen Con. And it's hard to track down things or people yeah. have them selling them for a lot of money. Yeah. So I'm excited to kind of get in on one of the Kickstarter or I don't, GameFound, not Kickstarter because Awaken Realms and GameFound. Duh. Um, <laughs> but I'm excited to kind of get in on the crowdfunding campaign yeah. because Matt and I love Nemesis. We've probably played it about four times since Gen Con. Every oh, single nice. time has crazy stories. Of course, we've lost every mm. single game, <laughs> but it's it's really truly more about the stories, and they it it's definitely like a cinematic feeling game. Yeah. So with this new version, instead of having a game board where you put out tiles that you're revealing as you mm-hmm. explore the ship, um, you're building out the map. So the they like kind of leveled up the exploration a bit. Oh, cool. Uh, where it's a modular map that you're building out as you're exploring. And there's like there are a lot more aliens you have to deal with. So they have upgraded like the player boards and they give you like different tools. So your your people are getting more souped up because you're dealing with more aliens and mm-hmm. everything. I don't know. All I know is I like <laughs> Nemesis. I still haven't played Nemesis Lockdown yet. Um, but I bought a Kickstarter copy of that from a friend of mine. Nice. So I have that. I need yeah. to finish painting those minis. But <gasps> yes. I'm planning to get retaliation. Cool. Um, so it was cool to just kind of get a really, really brief look at that one. Yeah. Uh, but but Paula, you need to get some rest. I uh, do. I am starting <laughs> to fall asleep here in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because we saw so many cool things and I know. Uh, we both love We're, talking about games. You can tell. I know. So we, I know. we talked about them, everyone. We've been talking. <laughs> We have been talking, and I'm sure if we were going to just sit here and stay awake, we could talk for another talk. two hours oh, yeah. about more stuff because that's how big Essen Spiel yeah. is. There's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. It's very fun and exciting, but I am happy to be home. Yes. And uh, looking forward to like digging into everything that I brought back. Yes. So anyway, Paula, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for and having me. This has been so fun. Awesome. Awesome. I had fun too. And I just, I knew when we scheduled this, I'm like, ooh, it's like right after, <laughs> it's right after Spiel. We're probably going to be tired, but you know. Got to put a podcast episode Gotta out there, it. you know. Got to do it. Stick into the schedule. Stick into the schedule. But yeah, thanks again. And seriously, 
we need to find some time because I have so many trick taking games, and yes, you need to play please. Rebel Princess, yes. and I need to play it too. So um, we'll have to find some time, maybe when it chills out, you know, around the holidays or something. Yeah, to either have you and your husband over or whoever, whatever, play some games together. Yeah, we don't live that far away. <laughs> yeah, we one hundred percent have to do that. I would love that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Well, get some rest. (laughs) Thank you. You too. (laughs) You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgamegeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.